Welcome to another episode of Neurotransformations, where we discuss stories of healing and badass transformations. I'm your host, Brody Miller, and today I have on my friend, Jamie Usher. Jamie is the fa- uh, the founder of Mind Trady and is based in the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria, Australia. In 2010, he was dealt an unexpected eye condition causing him to lose 90% of his eyesight. Prior to becoming legally blind, Jamie has uh Jamie ran a successful business as a tradesman as well in Australia. He has a love and passion for psychology and human behavior. He followed his passions is not and is now completing a master in professional psychology. Jamie works with his clients to help them find and become the ultimate versions of themselves by helping them break down self-imposed barriers, unlock emotional chains, and reframe trauma from past experiences. By helping his clients reach their desired goals within all areas of life, Jamie supports his clients to have more fulfilled and happier life experiences in life, and that's what it's all about. Jamie, I appreciate having you on. Matt, Brody, thanks so much for having me on, man. It's an honor. With with the work that you do and the quality of the stuff you do, it's definitely an honor to be on. So thanks, thanks, Ace, man. Thank you, man. Likewise. Um, I want to ask you, can you share us a little bit about your story, about how you overcame the challenge of losing 90% of your eyesight and kind of how that led to your current path in psychology and personal development? Yeah, for sure. Um, look, I, I guess the, like the, the initial kind of thing was like pretty, pretty full on. Um, and, uh, and obviously like, uh, like ultimately like life changing and life altering and almost like it, it former, it forced me to like become a different person because, I think just naturally my uh, my I guess my mindset on things like that wouldn't wouldn't be like oh this is this is it now I'm just going to be this person with a with bad eyesight and I'm not going to be able to work or you know I'm not I'm not going to live a happy life anymore I'm or I'm not going to chase my goals now I think luckily it wasn't like that at all so to to be able to uh, to be able to live a life with still feeling I guess fulfilled or being on that journey to find like I guess satisfaction and fulfillment in whatever I was doing because it was still I was still only 26 so pretty pretty like early in in life almost like in my prime in a lot of ways um like it it it, the, the I guess the message that I got from myself and my I guess my my conscious thoughts were Fortunately, it wasn't like this is going to get you or, you know, you're not going to be happy anymore. It was like, no, we need to find something. We need to find ways to be happy now. You're not going to, we're not going to let this, we're not going to let this stop us. Mm-hmm. I'm still, I'm still going to find a way to be happy. Like it was, it was obviously like, um, it was obviously devastating. Like it was, it was, it was a, like a completely, as I said, completely life altering thing to have happen to me. But um, I think I was fortunate enough, potentially because of the things that maybe had happened to me in earlier childhood or whatever it was. It was like a, a whole range of things that had kind of happened and I experienced. I think maybe potentially that built a resilience in in me. Um, but then like even 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 speaking to people, like even just like even more recent years, they're like, well, no, that's not that's not just it. There's like there's something else there. There's something else there that just that drives you. And, and, and I'm like, well, yeah, okay, I guess I'll find out whatever it is, but it's like, I'm thankful that I had it, whether it was just like a, a will to live. Someone else explained it to me that way, like, despite going through a time where I lost most of my vision and I had to give up my business and I, I couldn't drive anymore. And I couldn't fight kickboxing anymore. And, you know, I, I'm thinking things like, oh, you know, who's going to want me anymore? How am I going to find a partner and all that kind of stuff? I still had a will to, to, to do things. So like, you know, like when I, when I wasn't um, when I wasn't working, because as I said, I, I had to give up my business, and as you mentioned as well, like um, I I still had to just to do things. Like oh, I would rather be doing something than than nothing. So like I wasn't working, but like I might walk, I might walk once or twice a day when you know all my friends were working, and they might have had their own businesses or whatever they were doing. I was just walking, and 
and getting exercise in. Sometimes I would uh, uh, be up all night because I, you know, just the, how fast my mind was working. I'd sleep all day and uh, feeling absolutely like completely depressed a lot of the, you know, the first three to six months, maybe even 12 months as well. But I was still, I would still, when I got bursts of energy, like I would say if I had to go to the gym at 4 a.m., well, I'd go to the gym at 4 a.m. Like I would go and do things when I actually had energy. Um, but yeah, there was just the, the, I guess the mindset and the way of thinking that actually got me through it was probably attributed most to, well, we need to change to, to adapt to this, not change because I'm a bad person or I'm wrong or I'm, you know, but change to adapt to this new situation. I need to, I need to be able to like, uh, particularly the, the, I guess the intuitive kind of feelings or thoughts that I was getting was, um, I, I need to build a better relationship with myself because if I'm going to see nothing one day, which is originally what I what I was told, so I have like the eight to ten percent vision now, so I can't really see you know too well. But I was told originally that I was going to see nothing um, for the first three three months or so. I was gonna that's what I, my belief was because that's what I, what I, uh, I guess a, a neurologist told me. Mm -hmm. but what I was thinking was, well, if that's the case and all, all I'm really going to have predominantly is like mainly my thoughts, because like, I'm not going to be able to see things around me. It's going to be more to do with like the inside. Well, I want to have a good relationship with myself. Uh, and that's kind of where my journey started of improving my relationship with myself. And I guess with, with you know, my surroundings and, you know, how I felt about the, not just in my internal world, but like the external one as well. So that's kind of how I, the real kind of journey started from there. Thank you for sharing that. I know it's not the easiest because I, um, my myself actually had an eye injury. I haven't, uh, believe I told you, but I, I got shot with a paintball about, uh, six years ago in my right eye. Oh, wow. Um, and my vision isn't so good on, on that side, but then I, learn about a lot of different eye exercises to do to, to help that in, in like putting a patch over my eye. Um, yeah. yeah. That because if you don't use it, you lose it. Right. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think there's one thing I can hang my hat on uh, in all the things that I've learned about health is neuroplasticity, you know, which involves the brain's ability to rewire and adapt like you did to new circumstances. Um, mm. Can you talk about maybe how this neuroplasticity played a role in your life, whether you are aware of it or not in um, a term of developing maybe stronger hearing senses or smell um, or how did your brain compensate for the loss uh, or the, the partial loss of, of eyesight? Yeah, yeah, that's actually yeah, that's a really good question. Actually, um, I guess where I where I noticed it probably pretty quickly is like even when I was when I or today even as well, but particularly even the first say three to six months when I you know you know like if I'm crossing crossing the road or something like that, um, like I I I would cross the road more with hearing than than vision. Like if it's on a like relatively calm day and it's not too windy, I I don't even have to. I don't even have to look. It's all about it's all about hearing for me, and this is like really super super busy with traffic. But it's more about like I can kind of just stand on the curb and I can just listen for a second, and I'll know no cars are coming. Um, but it also, there's been a time where it was very early on where like I, we, I'll stop I will stop at like the traffic lights and I press the button to you know wait for the little man to turn green. Yeah. Um, not 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 that I could see the man turning green, but in Australia we've got this noise that comes on, like a beep 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 beep, and a vibration thing that comes on. So okay. like you kind of ho you hold your hand on this thing and you can feel the vibration, because uh, you know sometimes the, uh, the the noise isn't working, so at least the vibration is, so you know it's your turn to go. So I, I knew it was my turn to go, and I could hear this car still coming down the road. And like if I was to take like two steps, this car would have like. Take, like clean, clean me up and it would have been going uh, yeah. like 80, kilo, 80 kilometers an hour. So whatever that is to what, what you guys are at, maybe you were 50 or 45 miles or whatever Some that is. Roundabouts. Yeah, yeah, around, around there. So I, like I just, because uh, the thing is uh, you don't, you don't hear a car's engine most of the time unless it's or an exhaust. You hear the, you hear the tires on the road. And that's, that's what I was luckily tuned into. So like, I, like I'd taken a step and I just stopped and I kind of could, you know, tell that this car had gone past. 
so that that was probably a time where it, it became like a real a big change for me there uh, one of the, the 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 things I noticed most early on but also just like even even because I still build things around the house like wherever on maybe not build things but try to fix things where I can even yeah. just do a little bit of maintenance or whatever it is or even doing gardening or build building garden beds or landscaping or whatever it is sometimes I've, I've done a bit of that over the past however many years and I've got like a talking tape measure so it reads like it reads it whatever whatever it is it can say in inches centimeters millimeters meters whatever it is mm-hmm. um and that's been really that's been super handy for me but even my my touch of certain things is is like so like if I'm getting like screws or whatever it is out of my old tradesman box, I can kind of just pick it up or I can feel kind of what size it is or whether it's a flathead screwdriver or a Phillips head screwdriver or whatever, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, so you know, like life life has adapted totally like uh, like that. But also like that even I, I'm sure there's like a like probably because of the, the vision impairment, like and how it forced me to go more internal. Um, I think like even the emotional awareness. Like I always kind of had it probably more than most, most people around me anyway. But I think it just, it just went to a level that was far more extreme than what it was, which was, I guess in some ways it was like, you know, it made, made things tougher, but um, oh, I guess it made, I guess it made it tougher because I realized the work that I had to do. Oh, <laughs> so yeah. when I grew, when I grew an awareness of like certain, certain things that were holding me, holding me back or, or I just intuitively knew I, I guess I needed to work on. That um that that was definitely something I, I became far more aware of. So yeah, there's definitely been some some things like you know like um uh, you know that I've, I've just like adapted to without even without even ever without even thinking. And I think that's where you know that like how fortunate we are like as humans that when when we take away say an emotional connection to something like you know like when you start you know start thinking like oh how am I going to do this anymore or or I'm, I really miss that about life like how it once was like when you kind of take that away from it the human body has this incredible ability to adapt like Absolutely. it will adapt super super quickly like you and I could lose an arm taking away the emotional aspect of it we would adapt really really quickly it, the the hardest part would adapt to would be your like you thinking about living with that arm or how am I going to do this how am I going to do that what are people going to think and all that kind of stuff take right. that away we'll we'll like super quick adapt because it's like it's it's just the way we are like that's how how we've got this we've like we've survived for so long as you know as a as as, as humans is like we we adapt really well it's the things that we deal with um I guess on mostly on a a daily basis that on on necessarily the, the physical level it's because of the like the the emotions and the thoughts that we have attached to what's what's happening that that's what's tough to deal with but man like even, even just like even just like say you, you get a cut or whatever it is and and you know you can get it stitched up and and it will heal like how lucky are we that we have that that kind of thing or even you know em- emotional wounds and he- emotional healing and and even what, what you were like i guess specializing talking about like the the, the uh, brain brain recovery and you know rewiring and that kind of stuff like how super lucky we are to live live like this it's like if you're if you're not connected to this like, this kind of awareness of that like man people are missing out you know like they're kind of living living life kind of on 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 the on the terms of the experience that they've gone through not so much transforming their experience into into something that works for them so yeah i feel i feel pretty fortunate to be able to be connected to that kind of awareness awesome dude yeah i think so much about certain geniuses or they were coined geniuses uh like beethoven and who who suffered from different ailments but were still mm. able to do remarkous uh and marvelous stuff through the mm. way that they adapted in it's interesting that you spoke about uh, this is kind of a fancy term in taroception, which just means the ability for the body to perceive itself, uh, you, your ability to perceive um, your body's internal awareness. Um, mm. For me, before I started to meditate and close my eyes and understand that there was a world within inside of me. Um, Mm. I was really stressed out because everything was focused on the outer world and what was going on until I I went inside and closed my eyes and started to feel my heartbeat and things like that. Mm. Uh, 
yeah, it changed every, it really changed everything for me because yeah. I dealt with addiction. I dealt with, uh, you know, brain surgery and epilepsy, um, and still mm. do to some deg- uh, small degree with epilepsy, not nothing like it used to be in the past. Um, mm. but it really changed everything for me in, in the, uh, so I guess my question for you is, uh, what what advice would you give to somebody who is struggling with doing doing meditation or do, only wants to do five minutes at a time? What what is just like some simple advice you could give to somebody to like tell them to stay with it or to try? Yeah, yeah okay, yeah, that's a really good question. I guess um, I guess there's a couple of things I can mention mention on this one. I guess the first one would be like just start off on the level that you can. So even if even if for some reason your level is starting off at one or two minutes, like it's it's not so much to start off with how I guess how long you're doing it for. Don't don't get me wrong, that obviously is is an important factor, but it's more about you actually doing it. So if you were to do say half an hour of sitting, but you only did that half an hour once a fortnight, well, it's probably it's not as good. So it's more about probably building the consistency of like setting time aside and whatever it is and you can build up and you know for five minutes and build build up from there whatever it is but it's more about probably um the action that you're taking to to do this thing is like you're taking time to do something hard so that in itself is is an incredible thing so you even just doing that before you've even started the meditation is is really super super important because you know it's that's really hard to do sometimes uh, and and um being aware that Often meditation, I'm sure you would be super aware of this as well. Often meditation feels like the last thing that you want to do. The last thing you want to do is sit down and relax. And I think that takes that takes sometimes a bit of discipline to get over. Um because like when our like this this, you know, <laughs> there's parts of us that even though like our nervous system is uh the sympathetic nervous system might be firing and and we're um and you know, like the, where you know the, the the amygdala is firing, whatever it is, we might have been triggered by a relationship thing, or a work thing, or whatever it is. Like there's there's parts of us that maybe for for uh, some of us that might have lived there, um, lived that way for so long, potentially from childhood. Well, that's a habit that's hard to break because we find safety in that. Mm-hmm. We you know we find safety in, in being, um, I guess. Uh, like uh, hyper aroused or uh, however it might be in that way because you know when the heart's beating even though even though we're not thinking clearly we're probably not really happy but there's a sense of safety in it so that's that's a hard one to break so for sure. us to go no I, I'm gonna calm that down um that's that's um and look often often meditation isn't necessarily something that you look forward to obviously uh, uh, not uh, obviously sorry it, it's often something, that you've got to just do even though you don't feel like it that that's that's the thing you're kind of you're not doing meditation because it makes me feel great it's like it it, it can in over time it can make you feel amazing because you've done it consistently but one sitting of meditation is not necessarily going to make you walk away and you're going to have this dopamine rush all the, you, know, <laughs> you know it's not it's not yeah. like that so it's it's more about that consistency so as i said even if it was like building up to five minutes but you're doing it every day or every second day or three, four days a week, whatever it is like that, that kind of stuff is really super important. But chances are just probably like, like when you first started off going to the gym and you started to do weights or you were running or whatever it is, it doesn't feel good to start off with. Like it feels quite uncomfortable, but that's okay. Cause that's where everyone starts. And then you eventually get, um, you eventually get better and push through and persevere. And most of the, most of the, the things that are happening are unseen. So you've got to trust the process of what you're doing um is doing what it needs to do and i guess so we were just talking about this before that um i I started doing meditation in 2010 before you know before like a lot of the information was coming out i like i didn't know the science behind meditation someone just told me to do it someone told me to do it because it might be beneficial of calming my body down when i was going through the vision impairment and so i guess i i trusted the process somehow I, i was intuitively i intuitively knew this was doing something for me it didn't mean I was doing the right meditation to start off with or or maybe it's not necessarily right and wrong, but I guess ones that are more suited to me. But like I, I just like I I knew it was doing I knew it was doing something. Um so yeah, I guess those those kind of things is kind of trust that it's doing something, even though you might not always be able to see what it's doing. 
um, trust that it's it's probably going to be hard to start off with. Um, and well, man, man, not super hard as in like a really hard workout or anything like that, like that, but trust that it's probably going to be hard because it's often the last thing that your brain wants to do. Right. Um, you know, um, particularly if you're in that, that you know, the, the, you know, um, I, I have to talk about the brain, Brody. I have to say like when you're in that part of your brain and, but whether that's right or not, but I guess when that part of your brain is activated, <laughs> like the limbic system or the emotional state, it's often, often would be the last thing that you want to do. But that's okay because you can still just sit down and do it anyway, um, or ha- however you do meditation. And, and yeah, just the consistency. Just even even if it's say building up from one minute, two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes, whatever, whatever it is, like wait, let's just build build up. And it's more about the consistency of doing it rather than the amount of time that you're doing it for. So hopefully that might make it a little bit da- daunting for people. Like you don't have to sit down and have to do a, like a twenty minute or an hour meditation like every time like far out, but doing it but doing those smaller ones consistently are, are going to be far better than doing the longer ones i think this is me my personal view on it far better than doing the longer ones less consistently yeah, yeah you're dead on because a lot of times when we start out with meditation things tend to get more dis- disorganized and annoying at first when so you think it's actually bad for you because you sit down and your mind's going crazy we had a monkey mind and and you're dead on that yeah it stimulates different brain areas and with me when i recovered from uh brain surgery my prefrontal cortex was the area that doctors cut out a little uh, bit and the prefrontal cortex uh is responsible for impulsiveness and throughout mm-hmm. my 20s, I was very impulsive. If you were to talk to me, I was all gung-ho with drugs and alcohol. And mm-hmm. um, until I started to meditate and work with that brain plasticity, being able to create, you know, white and gray matter in my prefrontal cortex, rewiring that mm-hmm. area for strength. Uh, yeah, I feel, I feel better than ever before. So, yeah, I think like Jamie says, um, consistency is key because, mm. you know, we, we can do a push ups. So let's say you want to get strong. You're going to have to start somewhere. You're going to do a few push ups, mm. maybe even on your knees at first, mm. but continuing to do them over time, you can build up a strength there. And, and it's no different really with meditation. Mm. Um, totally. I but- guess what I've, what I've learned, what I've learned over time, on I guess more on the personal level of kind of the benefits of like what I was getting out of meditation and, and, and probably why, um, I don't know, like sometimes the universe can just send you things, I think, to kind of help you out. And so, and I'm even convinced that the, um, well convinced, maybe not convinced, but maybe I, I often have thoughts that, uh, that tell me like my vision impairment happened to, to help me out. It's still one of the best things that ever happened to yeah, me, yeah. you know, like, because it, cause it forced me to become far more internal in a way that I, and I needed it to become, but just wasn't for some reason. And I think also, like even being given meditation back back in the day was one of the the greatest things that I could have been given because, um, yeah, like my due to particularly due to, um, how my uh in critical stages of development when I was a when I was a child, like there was there's so much things even happening from from birth, like from birth time there was. There was like, um, uh, I guess, a kind of a bit of a hectic environment, uh, and then like in the age to two, three, four, there was kind of domestic violence stuff that was happening with the stepfather. Even my own father had his, you know, he's basically, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, he was my even my own dad to this day is a pretty shitty parent, and he knows it, um, and doesn't seem to be, um, you know, even still struggles with doing doing kind of parenting stuff today so back then he would have struggled with it back back then even more so you know but there was so there was like two two family environments with my a family environment with my mum and a, and a stepdad who turned violent um for a while and we we she was married to him for say five or six years and then the environment with my dad and, and my, my stepmom that was you know that was pretty crazy too because she she hated us after a while and um and it was just like not a not a healthy environment not a nurturing environment at all and the the the, the ironic thing is, is like in an environment where my stepdad, uh, sorry, with my dad and stepmom, we we would go for visitation, where it would be once a week or once a fortnight. Well, often in the age of me being four or three or five or whatever it is, 
we would try to run away from that house at night time. We were never successful, but we'd try to run away, me and my brother, and go back to the house where there was domestic violence. So mm. it was like the, my my you know my brain developed in a way where I guess my my amygdala and and the limbic you know limbic system and that kind of stuff was like so well activated for most of my life up until I don't know you know for however long you know like as as I was in critical stages of development that's that's how things were so safety safety and security and loving and nurture, um, nurturing um, and and acceptance. Um, uh, was not a thing that I, uh, myself and my my brother were um, really really felt. So, right. I, I guess having having certain, uh, or having uh, certain brain regions more activated than than others, and the you know the amygdala would have been would have been firing. I guessing a lot of the time because I'm like, <laughs> it would have been like, well, how am I going to feel safe? What have I got to do? And I guess I I developed that in, you know in um. Over over time, I developed it for some reason. Like, but in teenage years, I, I really went in inside myself, and I don't mean to do growth, but I really became super shy, super isolated. Because like there was a lot of in primary school and early high school, there was a lot of bedwetting because of because of the stuff that was happening, and that could be really common for for, for uh, kids in domestic violence households. Uh, was uh, there's a lot of anxiety and stress. And that was happening to me. So like the, the chance of me wanting anybody to find out, you know, that I was wetting the bed and you know, in when I was twelve or thirteen and still doing it even occasionally when I was fourteen. Like it's mm-hmm. you know, like that that those kind of experiences don't correlate or well they correlate, but they correlate negatively with someone who's going to have confidence, you know? Mm-hmm. Um so I guess I, I, I like when I was say Going into my twenties, and I and I was I became far better because I used to be, I I I got over certain you know not good feelings, uh, of of self doubt or self hatred or whatever it was by kind of, uh, I kind of owned certain things like if I felt that someone was being disrespectful to me or t- trying to take my power away, talking men, other men, men I'm talking, I would I, we would uh, you know I would handle it physically, and I became good at doing that. Yeah. Okay, and I really enjoyed it because I had this access to, I I could become I could become back in the day pretty cold and just switch on to something that most most of my other friends couldn't, and that would be like, well, now that person that, that person's I'm gonna I'm gonna do something to them because they've disrespected me or they've disrespected you or yeah. whatever. And I and I had I had good access to that, and it was actually the only thing in my in my life for a long time that ever made me feel. Uh, good for a long time in my early you know 18 19 20 it was the only thing that made me feel good or that I was you know I was different in some way for most of my life I was incredibly unconfident and I was scared to talk to girls and all this kind of stuff mm-hmm. um but they that is something that I had I felt powerful because it was like I um I could do things other things that you know most people would just talk about they would just talk talk crap about that they were going to stand up for themselves or whatever. No, I stood up for myself really good when, when most other people would be too scared to or or whatever. No, I, I had at least had access to that. So in my early 20s, I did develop certain things that I, I it did make me start feeling good about myself, but it was still something that was attributed to the fear center and, you know, like fighting or, you know, running or whatever it is. It was still attributed to that, but I almost became, I almost began to use that in a way that it started to make me feel feel better about myself rather than just yeah. be okay, totally kind of, you know, knocked down by it. And then um, I guess even, you know, when the, my vision impairment stuff happened and it kind of made me go really internal and do some work um, and then meditation came in, I guess the, the the real unseen benefits for me to start off with, as I said, prior, this is prior to like, you know, s- s- stuff on social media talking about it or a lot of, a lot of the, you know, I didn't have any access to the science behind meditation or anything like yeah. that. Um, I guess what I was ultimately doing was trying to calm myself down. That's what I think they meant that what the how the universe kind of had stepped in. This is what I believe to calm myself down. So, um, you know, I would have been my my amygdala was firing all the time, and <laughs> the limbic system was like that's how, that's where that's where I, like I almost just thought life was, you know, uh, in a in a fear state, whether it be fighting or you know uh, flight whatever it may be i just used to think that's what it was mm. um because like i hadn't i hadn't experienced life in any other way and then you know i, I think the universe stepped in and said learn this 
learn mm-hmm. this and this will calm this will begin to calm calm you down um uh, in in the way that you need to because it's not just about calming down it's not just about having a slower heart rate it's about when i can feel safe um I, i'm sure i'm sure you might be able to put this another way of put more insight into this but when we feel safe um and we can kind of calm ourselves down. We, I think other parts of our brain become more activated, which would be probably the prefrontal cortex. So when we're not having all the, you know, the frontal lobes, we're not, but when, when we're in like unsafe environments, we don't really have uh, access to that rational thinking and problem solving and, and, and that kind of stuff. And we are impulsive when we're in that, in that fight or flight state. And so kind of, I, I actually became um, far more in tune to, yeah, my actual, rational thinking about things and having good problem solving and that's that's what i realized my best way to put why i enjoy meditation so much is like there's less questions there the answers just become more clear so mm-hmm. it's not when when you have a clear head or a clearer head you're like, it's not like what do i need to do here this is what i'll do it's just like kind of answers will just pop in during the day after you've meditated well and it's not like when you've got a clear head you're meditating and an answer pops in now it's like over time when you can train yourself to be more calm and and i guess uh activate different parts of your brain and you know calm it down calm the nervous system and all that kind of stuff like it's over time that you feel the benefits not in one sitting as we said before but i think that's what what, there was a a real unseen benefit to start off with along my journey it's like as i said the i feel the universe kind of stepped in and said you learn this and then you and then you mix that with what what your previous experiences were you're going to have a better a better um a better view and a better perception on previous experiences and you're going to see see yourself better you're going to see the world better um but that was just never going to happen unless i found something like meditation i think so that's where i think the universe stepped in to help me out there yeah well thank thank you for sharing that it's uh I too had my own struggles with a lot of self-hate uh, growing in between my teenage years to about uh, late twenties. Actually, I, I used to look myself in the mirror and really just hate who is standing there because mm. he, I lack self-discipline. I, I was uh, into drinking. I was socially isolated, um, mm. got into, negative criminal activity and stuff um also because it gave me that sense of power uh that mm. you kind of alluded to because i i turned into that impulsive crazy guy like you come over and i'm going to be giving you drugs and alcohol and i i'm important now because i've got money and cash and and drugs mm. and stuff like that um yeah. just completely uh use my impulsiveness to try to gain fulfillment and that was the, the worst thing that I, I could have done um mm. but yeah i mean thanks uh i think a lot of people especially when you're younger you deal with a lot of self-hate and yeah um, totally. so important it is men that we talk about that that's okay number one mm. that's totally fine that you're feeling that and, and that you feel a lack of confidence and you feel that the mm. world is just out to get you that's that's yeah. totally valid and um because two guys here that have experienced that very same thing um mm. just know that um there there is help and you can change that was the totally. most important thing for me is knowing that my thoughts my actions my words my character my habits could change what I was feeling, um, even on a mm. moment to moment basis, I, I've learned as I've, uh, you know, with time in that on a moment to moment basis, we are changing our reality. Mm. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's for sure. And, and I think that's an important thing to, for you to talk about as well or for us to talk about. So like if, if people, whether it's, you know, men, men or women or whoever are like feeling that, that uh, whatever is like that feeling of like lack or they're not good enough or they, they that feelings of self hate or whatever it is like, it's it's not great that it's there, but it's good to have the awareness of it because I think it's it's a it's a I guess our our body or our minds and or and our minds way of saying there's something that could be there, 
So I, I would, I think, in looking back on my time, I would rather feel the feelings of now look, looking back on it is that I'd rather feel those feelings of hate rather than feeling that being someone that's just neutral and just in the middle. I, because I think someone that's feeling down has the opposite to feel, uh, has the opportunity to feel the opposite as well. If I was just someone who didn't really feel, well, I wouldn't really do do things. I wouldn't really make changes. Some some people kind of just go about their day and don't right. really feel certain things. Yeah. And then so they're not, they're not, that's, that's what they're driven by. They won't really make changes. They won't really, you know, because yeah. they don't feel those feelings. So I, I'm glad that I've had access to feeling those really shitty feelings and the self hate because it kind of it was a real kind of um, an indicator to me like where I needed to make make changes and I think that's you know for anyone that might get those feelings like oh like I don't feel confident well that's that's okay because it means that there's something that could be worked on you know like there's 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 room for improvement yeah and uh, I think potentially maybe maybe I didn't uh, fully answer something that you um answer me before like i guess the the i guess rewiring of the brain i mean like um like for around particularly around negative core beliefs because like my my core beliefs were around that i'm not good enough mm -hmm. um and and um i guess i'm i'm always going to have a fight like you know people aren't I, my i i had a belief of rejection people talk about a fear of rejection i had a content belief and I'm talking, I was almost content with it, even though I hated it, but I was almost content with the fact that people were going to reject me, mm -hmm. males and females, whether it be relationships or whatever. Because of my upbringing and a, and a whole bunch of stuff, um, I, I just, out of safety, I, I taught myself a, uh, or, or I gave myself through, um, you know, I, I, a form of therapy that I love, I'm not sure if you've heard about it, is schema therapy. So my, my schema around like how to handle this, uh, my my experiences um, is that I, I like a schema that I formed and like a schema is like the way you process information. So how I process the information of what I experienced when I was younger or process different parts of information is that I, I you know, I just believe that I just wasn't good enough. I was going to be rejected. There was something about me, maybe that I was defective or there was something broken. That, you know, that's, that's what it was. So, uh, because what, what we do when we're, when we're children is we, um, particularly in, you know, between birth and seven years of age, or it, it can be, that's on average, it can be later or whatever, but around then there's critical stages where we're forming beliefs and, and our, what we call schemas, how we're going to see ourselves or other people in the world. Um, and so, like, yeah, my one of my ones was that I was I was going to be rejected. People weren't going to like me. I wasn't going to have good attachments with people. Um, you know, females weren't going to like me, or, or all what that kind of stuff. Males were someone that I that I had to um, be wary of, and one day uh, be uh, you know overpower. And so they didn't have power over me anymore. It was little little things like that. And yeah. I think that was probably my my biggest my biggest thing that I I had to um, train myself. Um, that I actually was deserving of exactly what I wanted, and everything that I wanted, every everything that I wanted to make happen was completely up to me on completely on the level of like well, what what actions and behaviors and energy that I put out to the world over time. That's what it, that's what it's up to. Yeah. Um, and but there's obviously there was big barriers obviously prior to that, you know, because I, I had a that belief process, system. That, um, other aside from the meditation and some of the things you've already discussed, what did hmm. that process kind of look like for you um did you or did you do affirmations or anything like that like um how yeah. do you begin to uh <laughs> that's, just that's, a, that's like an interesting one. a more empowering story really so um i actually did start off with um i guess some kind of affirmation and uh, affirmations and then even uh, like originally i created my own mantra <laughs> that I was repeating to myself. So I told you before when I wasn't working, I would go on long walks and what I would do. So like these long walks might be like 45 minutes, like up and back. So like a 90 minutes in total. And I would like, I would repeat this mantra to myself. And I would often like, if no one was around, I can, I could hear that no one was kind of around me. I would like say to myself, like, no, I, I am good enough. I am worthy. I, I, I am, I am confident or whatever it was, whatever I was saying to myself. And I would say that, like uh, close to like for for ninety minutes while I was walking, and if I heard if I heard footsteps ahead or behind me, I would kind of stop, and then yeah. when someone walked, I, I would start again. But I was like, that's the level that I started at because I thought that was going to be ultimately beneficial. Right. Yeah. And you know, I didn't know any better. 
And I guess that was a good place to start. Like, I would never convince yeah. anyone to do the same thing because it's fucking crazy. Let's be honest, it's fucking crazy, and I wouldn't yeah. do that. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't want anyone else to like to think that they need to do that. But that's how, like, I wasn't aware fully that, like, that I didn't think much of myself because that's the thing. Are people aware that they don't think much of themselves, or do they just think about themselves and that's it, and that's set, and that's that's it? For me to go, no, I don't think enough about myself was was a way of me being able to go, well, I can think more of myself. So mm-hmm. that's why I was, you know, that's why I started those things. But that's where it started. But yeah. I guess probably the best answer to your question is like, I guess, like what, what would I have done? Well, I guess the ultimate way for even probably that I think that even, I guess, you know, creating those new um those new patterns and rewiring the brain in, in certain things like there's, there's this, that's a good starting point, but yeah. I guess actually uh, like actions, that's actually doing something, doing mm-hmm. something that is, that is the, the behavior of someone who actually would think something about themselves. So I, I asked myself the question, like, well, what would someone who does think like good things about themselves or does have self-belief, well, what would they do? And I guess one of my best examples of that is, what, as we were talking about before, is say getting up early. So getting up early yeah. originally wasn't, you know, it's not just, it's not just about that I'm giving myself more time, or it's um, or you know, there's you know, it's it's so much in the I guess social media people love talking about it now, which is which is good because it does have great benefits. But it wasn't it wasn't so much um, it probably even intuitively wasn't for me about that. It wasn't um. Like, although it was giving me extra time to study and all that, but it wasn't like that. It was more about, well, what's a behavior that I can do so then I can start feeling more about myself? Because of like, if you don't really truly believe in yourself, well, you're not going to get up at 4.30. You're not going to get up at 4 a.m. Because like, you're going to be battling with that per- that uh, that inner voice or the inner critic in your head that tells you you're not good enough. So why get out of bed? Yeah. So, so but one of the greatest ways to even calm down and silence or turn the volume down on the inner critic is just to do something anyway. Do do what it's probably telling you you can't do. So, and then over time, the volume on your inner critic will turn down. But then also over time, if you're performing the action and the behavior of someone who thinks something about themselves, so thinks like that they're valuable, so they're worthy to do this thing, well, you're going to start feeling that. You're going to get that effect. Absolutely. So, like one of the one of the things someone taught me is, um, or I'd heard somewhere it might have been from a book or something like that was, like if you want to grow confidence, well, you have to start performing the uh, the the actions of someone who is confident. So, like that's that's how you grow confidence. You don't grow confidence by reading a book, sitting in your room, and learning how to be confident. It doesn't 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 matter. And affirmations, like I could have a thousand affirmations a day, but if I'm sitting in my in my bed and lying in my bed, well, those affirmations are going to do absolutely fuck all. But if I, <laughs> you know, that's that's the reality, isn't it? But but you could have this is this is the thing about you know people talk about you know not feeling enough about themselves and negative self doubt and the inner critic and all that. Well, you could have an incredibly tough inner critic. You could have incredibly tough self doubt. Um, you could you could feel like nothing about yourself, but if you perform one action, one action that is in the step in the right direction of someone who does have value, does have self belief, they want to feel more about themselves. Even if it's like having slightly more healthier meals and getting into like really healthy meals further down the track, like that is an action of someone who thinks about themselves. That isn't someone. That is an action of someone who has more self esteem and self confidence. So if you start performing those actions, you we are rewiring those beliefs. But it's not going to be coming through reading books. It's not not well. It is your books. You'll get the information. That's great. You know, affirmations might give you something to tell yourself. But it's the actions that, like the actual actions of um, us doing things that really make the most significant impact. Because as I said, you could have like really self doubting beliefs. But if you perform one action that will challenge those beliefs, and those those um, those beliefs over time will will change, and although not even just the beliefs, but the the thoughts, the thoughts will change. And yeah. I, I'm sure uh, I'm sure we might have ch- chatted about this before, which I'm uh, um I think uh, even when I, when I get you again on on my podcast, I'll, I want to talk about it even more. But it's like in in actions. Well, even in thoughts, there's there's energies attributed to these to these thoughts, mm-hmm. um, and then and so we yeah we can change our thoughts, 
which you know uh, does make a pretty significant impact because we have so many thoughts a day but uh, it is often really hard I, and I know this for myself it is really hard just to change negative self-doubting beliefs or thoughts into something that are solid like positive positive like self self-believing thoughts it's really hard just to do that through to say like um cognitive um behavioral therapy or something like that yeah. like it's, it's 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 not just that easy like it's good to be aware it's a good those kind of forms of therapy or whatever it is are good to have you be aware of those kind of things but the ultimate way to actually start changing the way you think about yourself is by acting differently and then by acting differently like that has the most i think like energy changing output or and, and that's how you you can change the the output, uh, the you know, the energy output of what you're putting out, and then ultimately what you'll get back. But it's then that you will notice, say, I might have had self doubting, um, or the self doubting beliefs or thoughts. Say when I was lying in my bed, and you know, when my alarm went, went off for the first time at four thirty. But when I got up anyway, and I was say in the kitchen, and I'm like making myself a, or giving myself a pre workout to really fire myself up, because that's what I used to do at four thirty when I first started getting up. I would have a scoop of pre-workout like I was going yeah. to the gym and I was like charging. So that's that's a good tip for people if you want to get up early. But it was like my, but quite literally my thoughts will change into, a, oh, you know, it's fucking, this is going to be hard into, I'm up in the kitchen. I'm like, fuck yeah. Well done, man. That was tough. Yeah. So quite literally my actions changed my thoughts um, in probably the most significant way. My And, and my thoughts around, around those kind of things, like they just changed. They, it wasn't like I hadn't. Uh, I had to um, like make special effort to change the thoughts. That's what I tried to do. Over, like initially, I tried to change the way I thought. Yeah. But what I, what I learned was more about if you want to change your thought, you've got to change your behavior. You've got to change your actions because they're the most difficult ones. Change those habits. You change them, and then just by, by like more naturally, will your thoughts thoughts change over time. And I think um, yeah, the, the the actions and behaviors and habits that we have have the most incredible uh, impact on our energy output. Um, and then obviously we'll have the most impact on that. Obviously, you know, our energy input as well from the universe or whatever is we're connected to there. So if we want to change a belief about whatever it is, about, about ourselves or other people about the world, we have to change our actions and behaviors and habits. And that's, that's where the most significant impact will come. I truly believe that. Yeah, exactly. Because nobody likes a hypocrite. And yeah, <laughs> nobody likes a hypocrite when you think about it, because they're not aligned. They'll be saying one thing. Oh, yeah. You know, like eating good is so healthy and uh, mm. there's like a chain smoking cigarettes or or, or doing mm. something dirty behind the scenes uh, anyway. Yeah. But like there's a cognitive dissonance that occurs when mm. having a thought about something but then the actions pertaining to it don't align. So there, mm. I've, I've experienced some cognitive dissonance in my life, and that's exactly what's happening in the brain is, okay, well, I want to lose weight, but what actions am I taking about it? Okay, well, uh, I'm doing mm. some push-ups, I'm doing some exercises, but then I'm uh, like binge uh, eating donuts like every Friday night or something like that. It's it just... It doesn't, there's a dissonance that occurs and I don't mm. look like that person. And as you uh, attributed to the power of our, the true power of, of our actions is so important. Mm. Yeah, totally. And it's, and there's just, yeah, there's just like, uh, um, yeah, there's just a, a, particularly that the energy change, I mm -hmm. think that can, that can occur. Um, and I think that's yeah, the most significant impact because yeah, as like in in your scenario, that example you just gave then, like you could um the, the hardest thing to change would be that happen of say not not having say the donuts, and that's really proving to yourself that you're um you 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 want to lose weight or you want to you want to I guess feel better about yourself because like it's, um I guess also I'm fortunate that I like I I I guess I had the thoughts like um like okay, well, how how bad do you really want this like what are you actually going to do to make this happen how bad do you want it and then that kind of fires me up and charges me up um and i can it kind of makes we can makes me do some really strong things but i guess 
you know, for people that may not have access to that, that kind of that inner, that inner strength or the inner motivation or drive in the, drive, drive in the same way, well, just start somewhere. You got to start somewhere. Like, yeah, um, exactly. do, 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 do a little thing that maybe you, you previously felt, um, harder to like, um, control yourself on, like we were talking about before, like, um, yeah, uh, say so impulsivity, and so like even meditation kind of gives you that. Uh, it can create a gap, help you create a gap in between, you know, you and your impulsiveness. So you've got a bit of time to think about maybe what you should actually be doing rather than just be just be there. Like I don't want to eat that rather than going, oh, actually no, maybe I shouldn't because it'll make me feel bad or I won't feel that great afterwards. I don't really need that bit of chocolate or drink or alcohol or whatever the hell it is. It's like it helps you create that gap. So, um, but yeah, it's like, it, sometimes you've got to ask yourself, how bad do you want it? And, and then I, and then like, well, what actions are you going to take to, uh, to actually make that change? Are, are you, are you committed? Are you interested? I had mm. a one time say, you know, Brody, are you committed or are you interested? And I said, <laughs> really, to be uh, quite frank, I'm, I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Yeah. That's, that's cool. Um, so, so something else that might, might be might be uh, of interest to people about how I kind of changed the way I was thinking, uh, or even even you know what I even I guess it's more is this is on more like a meta meta cognitive level. I changed the way I was thinking about my thinking, and so like um, I remember when I when I first went to a psychologist back after I don't know it was like a relationship breakdown or whatever whatever it was, and that's that's actually another thing I can I can just briefly touch on, but. Um, why I um why I started to go to a psychologist was that I, I didn't feel very good about myself, but I knew I didn't feel good about myself. So I wasn't like, oh, I feel good about I don't feel good about myself. Like I knew I didn't. I'm like I, I didn't know why. And I kind of was comparing myself to other people. Well, why do they seemingly feel good about themselves or hold themselves more confidently? And I and I don't. Anyway, after maybe the first five or six sessions with this person, I remember her saying to me, like uh, you know, because of your experiences and you know the you know actions and behaviors and all that kind of stuff, stuff in childhood, like yeah, I, th I think you have low self esteem. And I remember going away and thinking about that and like touching on it, and, like in myself, and you know, kind of like trying to I don't know, understand what that meant. And I remember like then in the next session, I remember she mentioned it to me again, and I said, well, look, I just wanna just wanna kind of uh, touch on that here. I I don't really like the way that you tell me that. I don't like how you tell me I have low self esteem. The way that I'd prefer to think about it is that I have a certain amount of self-esteem now, but I have access to so much more. So like I'm like, I currently have low self-esteem, but it could be high. But if you tell someone they've got low self-esteem, it's far more concrete. So you've got to even the way watch the way that we tell people things. Oh yeah. Um, you know, like even even um even more recently in in like now, how I've I have i have advanced my way of thinking and even like um, so like when I say go to the psychologist now, whenever I need to, like, and we've discussed more, re more recently about how he, uh, this is a different one, um, a different psychologist. We've discussed more recently how he would believe that I would have, um, like, um, he, in his words, rubbing up shoulders with, uh, with OCD. So I've got pretty strong OCD, tra OCD traits, but that was really incredible for me to hear that. Cause I'm like, Oh, that, that makes so much sense. That's why I was obsessing about this and obsessing about that and, worrying what this person was thinking. So my OCD wasn't like I've got to check the check that the car doors locked or the house doors are locked because I'm paranoid about, you know, like someone breaking in, which is what my wife does. Um, uh, <laughs> but mine, mine was obsessing about what you think about me in a room. Uh, like because it was almost like well, what that person thinks or so it was mine was more socially probably because of like i had to develop that at a i guess a hyper level where in like environments of domestic violence and with people who didn't like me and all that kind of stuff or well i wouldn't i didn't feel safe around um but yeah even even just that so like it's not so you've got to go okay ocd and like what that stands for is obsessive obsessive compulsive disorder but disorder almost has for a lot of people a negative kind of connotation but for me it's no it's not it's not negative it's like okay this is how your brain works um in, in in certain areas and and let's learn to manage it and when you learn to manage it it can work for you in this incredible way so that's why i like that's why i obsess about how i love learning about psychology how i love learning about like i guess exercise reading how i feel how i've just got to where i am now because i'm obsessed about life yes but if i you know i i'm but uh, if i um 
if I kind of let it rule me, well, then yeah, it'll, like maybe maybe how I used to obsess about myself and life was in a completely negative way, but I've been able to spin that. And I guess because um, I've worked with a lot of teenagers in a, in a high school where I work, but also even when I'm doing my own private practice stuff as a psychologist, um, I'll be dealing with people where technically I'll be giving them, you know, like uh, according to the DSM-5, the um the you know the statistical manual that the psychologists and psychiatrists can use to help diagnose people according to the symptoms like i might say to someone okay you know you, you have adhd or you have asd which is autism spectrum disorder but it's like just because you have these things doesn't mean it's ultimately negative it could just be the way it's explained to people could be well like that you have these symptoms and traits well but let's learn ways of dealing with it in the most effective way so like if you've got adhd uh, you know attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or add or whatever it is what any of those kind of things like let's let's learn to use it in the most positive way because you've got this special gift almost or not even almost like my my vision impairment was a is a gift to me and so like other people's things that they have even like i'm sure in some ways like you're your brain injury you experienced was a gift to, to you because of what it helped you learn afterwards. So it's more like have what you've been able to do, I guess, naturally, or whether you got support as well. It's like, it's more about managing this experience or managing this gift. Uh, and that's kind of, that's what it taught me to do. And that's what I'll be teaching people to do as well. So like, if I ever had to give someone a diagnosis, which I'm sure I will, but I won't just be giving it to them like, oh, you've got this diagnosis and that's it. It's like, okay, that's cool. Let's, that kind of explains the symptoms of what you've got. And we could potentially put you in this category of like, this is what what it might be attributed to. But it's like more, let's learn how to use that. You know, like that's, that's why I feel really fortunate to be in the field that I'm in because it's like, you know, like if I believe that person went, like I guess they were ultimately trying to tell me something that was trying to help me out. But if I believe that psychologist who told them, who told me that I had low self-esteem, what if I just took that as I have low self-esteem? Yep, yep. And that's what I walked away thinking. You know, so um, that's that's. I think there's 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 a certain super important thing there to like understand. Um, you know, like whether if we are do if we do get a diagnosis or whatever it is, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a life sentence. If anything, it can be flipped and be turned into a gift. Like I, I truly strongly believe that. But that that totally depends on the mindset that you have to it, not the experience or not the diagnosis. It doesn't depend on the diagnosis. It depends on your attitude towards the diagnosis. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. You're speak. You're speaking my language, and I actually <laughs> got a, an idea for a shirt. It's it's gonna say OCD is my superpower because oh, yeah, I love that. Be, being somebody who also really struggled with obsessiveness, it would yeah. it's become my superpower because I would get Probably. obsessed in whatever I would be doing, and whether that was being a bad person, I was yeah. and pretty good at it being a pretty bad bad person to be quite frank. Probably. But now yeah. flipping that around, it, OCD is it's like my true uh superpower what makes me different than the average uh you know the average joe on the side of the street who's uh you know not really i'm obsessed with life i'm passionate about life yeah totally yeah 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 that's 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 the thing yeah i think that's that's the thing about what's um you know uh people like i like i will never be i'll never be beaten down you know, like, oh, I could be beaten down, but I'll never give up. I'll never, never give up. There's not even, not even a chance that I'll, I will ever give up on life. Doesn't matter what you throw at me. Doesn't matter what you put me through. Like, I will have, you know, I could have incredibly down days. I could have down times. I could have down yeah. years. But yeah. I will learn to live with that, that, um, that, that, that feeling, whatever is attributed to whatever will happen. Because it's like, I know that there's, there's something there. I would rather live with a day of pain than not live at all. You know, I'd love I'd rather live with a year of pain, a year of emotional pain, you know, than not live at all because because it's like at least I'm feeling mm-hmm. at least I'm feeling something. Yeah. And sometimes like sometimes those sad feelings or those grief feelings or those shame feelings, like when you work work through them, like those emotions and those lower energies, although they feel like fucking horrendous, man. Like there's like working through them and why they're finding out why they're there. 
that can often lead to some incredibly good feelings once you work through them and and like understand why behaviors need to be changed, thoughts need to be changed, all that kind of stuff. And I would rather live with those. Like I don't want to live with shame, but I don't I don't want to live with grief. I don't want to live with sadness or anything like that. But I'd rather live with those and not live at all, but work my way through them. Um, and so like no matter what happens, man, like um, you know, like I'm 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 going to be here, and that's my my will to my will to live. And then it potentially could be that obsessiveness that we're talking about. Maybe we're just obsessed about life, we're obsessed about being here. And we're yeah. going to find a way. We're going to find a way to do it on, I guess, on on our terms, because that's what the universe wants. So what universe wants us to do it that way, not in a selfish way, but like our terms is by, I guess, ultimately, like you know, empowering other people, whether it be, um, you know, like in the way that you do it or the way that I do it or whatever it is. It's like, we like, how super lucky are we that like we've had, we've got that that will or that drive or that yeah. love of life, like. There's there's things we've gone through that aren't necessarily considered lucky by most people, but um, how lucky we that we've got that will to be able to like deal with it and manage it. Yeah, I've I've had people tell me in the past, hey, you care too much. Well, <laughs> my response to that is, you care too little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Actually, yeah, because actually that's an interesting thing that you say because that's what I did realize about man. There was a different. There was a difference in me, say, particularly with my um in my teenage years, uh, like hanging around people. Like I cared too much. I cared what other people thought. I cared what I thought. Like uh, you know, I I cared too much about things, and I did obsess about it. But that sets me apart. I do care. Exactly. Yeah. I, like I, you know, like I care about myself. I care about other people, and that's why I'm. I'm in the field that I'm in now, but and that's what I'm doing. What I'm doing now, much like you. But we've been able to harness those obsessions somewhat they sometimes get out of hand but at least we can or at least a lot of the time or some of the time or most of the time whatever it is have um have, have you know have a harness on them and then when we do we can kind of make them make them work for us exactly don't don't ever let anybody tell you who you are no way don't don't no ever let because people are going to try to do it don't don't ever let somebody tell you who you are and totally. that's it's People care too little. I I care about the world. I care about the next man, and that is what makes me different. And this is why I am going to thrive, and I am mm. thriving because uh, the world is just changing. It's no longer going to be a dog eat dog world, in, in my personal opinion. Um, mm. that's the last question I wanted to ask you is: uh, I ask a lot of people recently, what is your mm. opinion on AI and what? Um, where the direction that is headed in, um, it's you, interesting. It it, yeah. yeah, like I can, I can honestly say that I have not, I don't have enough, uh, I guess, knowledge of it to to truly understand it uh, in even at a, at a beginner's level. But I can definitely see that there's benefits of it, and I can definitely tell why it would be. Oh, I could definitely feel that it'd be scary to a lot of people, probably just like when a lot of other things came out, like say, say when the internet came out, that probably would have been incredibly scary for us. And that, that ultimately has incredible benefits, incredible um, positiveness, but also has incredible dark side as well. Yeah. So I think, um, I think this is just one of those things where it's going to be, I think it's going to be really positive in a lot of ways but also yeah look it's going to have its downsides too but i i guess i i'm not exactly sure what those benefits are but much going going much like what we were talking about before about how the, uh, the humans have this incredible level to adapt well what what if the way of thinking was uh, thinking about it was well Although people talk about, you know, like it's taking away, our, you know, you know, like, you know, it can write assignments for us, it can write a children's book for us, or what, whatever it is. But <laughs> like, yeah, if if you're if you're going to use it that way, well, then maybe you are going to put a limit on your thinking and, and you know advancing. But what if um, the the humans that do want to thrive and do want to advance, what if this actually helped them? It goes to the higher levels of consciousness, just like a lot of other things have. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I think there's the potential to help us there, and I think like they, it's often like we, the universe, the universe, or whoever it is, 
whatever it is, is hands us these things as humans on a, on a planet like however it is it gives someone an idea and then that idea is like comes to fruition like it could potentially be one of the things that helps us really advance as humans like it's there's not yeah. all it's not all scary no. um but i could say definitely say there's both both sides but it's just um, imagine if like we then like what it like what it can do is if it it's it's more about helping how it can help us advance is, as humans like in whether it be like in, in our civilizations the way we build things like or the way that we even think because if it can help us think at higher levels of consciousness like i'm sure that i do i truly believe that that it's like well if that does a lot of the other stuff that we used to do um we, we could sit back and go oh we'll just let it do it but it's more about no it's like well now that we don't have to do those things imagine where we can advance to and i think but that's what the, the potential that it probably has but that, that's probably my best answer for you man that, that's be beautifully said and you you gave me new perspectives to think upon that because if fear becomes your dominant thought with anything ultimately mm. it's going to become your reality because you know, ultimately, we have a choice to to choose trust and love, or we can mm. choose fear. It's going to dominate our thinking mm. about that. And uh, yeah, thank you for thank you for that because I, to be quite frank, I it does uh, it used to scare me more than it does mm. now, and still I'm a little anxious about it. But the way that you mm. explored that so eloquently that. It, it really does give me a new empowering perspective, like that we can um, upgrade, not upgrade, but we can uh, reach an ultimate or higher mm. state of consciousness. So um, mm. thank you. Thank you for that. And yeah, uh, that's my, my pleasure, man. Like, the, as I said, like the, there is things that are, I think the things about it that might be might be a little bit scary to me is like say so when I started university this year my uh, doing my masters this year it was the first year where they made mention of like obviously like we, we have things in place now that where we can kind of tell or we're going to you know like we can try and find out whether things have been written by using that kind of stuff because as a friend of mine that knows it really well that they had to use the say chat chat B, PT or whatever it is GPT whatever it's called <laughs> Yeah. it can write like at, at like at really high levels assignments for you yeah and that that is scary yeah. um and like I, I almost don't want anything to, to even know how to do that because i would like um because like i would never want it, it, it i guess the i guess the thought to be, to be out of camera and go oh, i'll just get some help for that or I'll just get some help for this it's like i don't want anything to do with that but i guess there's there's also the potential that there is a little bit of fear around well what if somebody did think I'm using it and I can't prove otherwise? Well, I'm like, well, just like, well, what, what could I do? There's just, all I could just trust the fact that like I haven't, I haven't cheated. I haven't, I haven't used it to do things for me in a way that I shouldn't have done. Like I just, there's, you know, there's a little, some little fears around it, but I guess like imagine, imagine say 10 years time, 20 years time, like this thing will just be a thing, just like the, how the internet is now, and the next big thing will come along, whatever it may be. You know, who, who knows what it might be? This is, I think, that's just another thing that will could potentially has the the opportunity to help us advance. But you know, other than that, I really don't know a whole a whole lot about it. But yeah, it's um, it is. It's going to be an interesting world that we're going to be living in in the next you know few years. Absolutely, man. Uh, buckle up and uh, <laughs> yeah, buckle up. <laughs> Get buckle up in a good way, Jamie. Uh, really, really, really appreciate ha having you on awesome perspectives and um just awesome genuine good guy and uh, amazing story we we appreciate you man and uh, i'll be looking forward to having you back on at some time uh man thanks so much it's always a pleasure chatting to you as like we we uh we're just despite being i guess pretty far away from each other we're, we're definitely uh on a pretty pretty similar journey and uh you know connected in really similar ways so i feel i feel really really good about being connected to you in this way brady so thanks Steve, for having me on absolutely where can uh people reach out to you at so uh, i guess probably where i'm on most um prominently is um on instagram so the minds tradey um and you know or they can look me up on my website which is the mind um but that's probably the best way to to get me and then all my links to other connections and email or website or whatever are all on there as well. Great, Jamie. Well, 
That's uh, all she wrote. We'll talk soon. All right. Thanks so much, man. Sir. Sure.